Not just at the dark. Welcome back to Unfiltered and Uncensored Talk with young alumni from historically black colleges and universities. Uh, big show again. We got Oars the Morganite, Fat Brother Eric, uh, Uno on Instagram. Uh, we got a lot to talk about, especially because uh, because of my loaf and we've missed uh, several of the past uh, weeks. So let's get straight into it. Um, the debates. So we are one down on the presidential and vice presidential side. The takeaway for me, no HBCUs mentioned in either one of them. Um, the Trump administration had things to mention, did not. Harris Biden administ- uh, or would be administration had things that they could have mentioned for plans, did not. All of them circulate around African American outreach um, and promotional effort. I I, I kind of got a sense about how we all feel about the debates, but let's contextualize how you feel about the debates in the bigger frame of do you think it was a missed opportunity that HBCUs weren't mentioned in it? Let's go. Let me see who's who's likely the most say the Rose Ratchet thing first. Or let's go with you. Um so I missed both of them in <laughs> reality. He was awful. Because they're always on Wednesdays and I have I have grad school on Wednesday, so I didn't I didn't get to see much. But I mean I, I saw most of the commentary and stuff. I mean, quite frankly, what I expected from Trump, we got from Trump. What I expected from um, Pence, we got from Pence. Um, I think that in general, the messaging from Kamala and from Joe Biden has been pretty weak. But I think that their goal is to get those disillusioned white voters um, who, you know, like, oh, Trump is bad, we're better. So I think that's more of their focus. I think HBCUs in general don't get enough of the attention, but... I don't see how they can with, um, again, the comment, the, uh, not commentators, the moderators going all over the place, the, uh, <laughs> the, the rhetoric going all over the place. I mean, and at this point, there's no undecided voters. If you are stuck between Trump and Biden, I don't, I don't want you a part of my coalition anyway. So I'd actually like HBCUs to be out of it. Let's push when someone's elected. Um, I think in general, we can be a, a misappropriated bargaining piece. So I'm not too mad yeah. that we weren't mentioned. Uno laughing. What you what you think about it? Um yeah, it was it was missed. What I thought though was when um when Senator Harris said that she wouldn't take um a vaccine, I thought about two HBCU presidents taking Ooh. the vaccine. And I was like, that was <laughs> So, you know, oh, no. that might have been an opportunity, might have not, but I was like, yeah, you ain't going to say nothing? Okay, that's cool. We just keep popping. <laughs> was it, but, but, but was it, that was a, that was a, that was a big thing to, to talk, to have the, the, the would-be vice president say, I'm not going to take it. And I hadn't even thought about that perspective about the, the two of our presidents who have signed up for the trial. Um, but even with that, that could have been something that should have been brought up specifically because Trump just what a couple weeks ago said, I'm going to ship all these tests to HBCUs. So these are it legitimately across the South in the mid Atlantic. These are the hubs for testing black folks, at least right. for the virus, according to the number of tests we have on campus. Then you have right. a story to come out, which we'll get into later about HBCUs are doing exceptionally well at preventing COVID outbreaks on campus. So that 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 brings me to the conclusion that that's something that should have come up. Right. It, it, and Trump should have said, this is what we're doing well. And, and if you're going to criticize the response, you're going to say, here's more of what you could do with HBCUs, particularly because African-Americans are disproportionately impacted. Fat, what do you think about it? Where do I start? Um, <laughs> first of all, I, I'm kind of with oars on this one, and this is just to keep it a buck. Like, don't you? I mean, because here's a real thing about it, right? If we're really going to discuss like what this looks like, Trump and well, Trump could have used it against Biden, who was part of an mm-hmm. administration that we can argue led to some things happening that 
significantly decreased enrollment at HBCUs under President Obama's you know administration. We could we could have that conversation and they could they could use that. But what it sells to me is that today I saw an advertisement where Trump just used all black people. And I was just like, we don't have we don't have the time nor the income to be this willfully ignorant to when people are just being used for when it's beneficial and not like in the long run, right? All these things that you know, talking points, they, they really don't matter because when it comes to a debate, if you're really trying to sit here and say something that you did better than another uh than, than another party or something that you will do, continue to do or do better than another candidate, then why are you not bringing up this thing for this particular population, which for many Democrats, you know, especially those who are more ne neoliberal Democrats, black people have been largely part of the base of who their guaranteed voters are going to be. Uh, so when you take that into account, I'm just kind of sitting here like, just all a wash. Like, and at some point, it just comes back to like, how many people watching it are going to just sit there and accept what's being told to them? And and are they just going to go based, based upon what they feel is true? Or are they going to actually like do some, some work and some research? Because... At this point, like like I said, like or said, ain't no undecided people. And if you are undecided, no. like why? Like oh my bad, uh, my bad. Unless you're like uh, Roland Martin and the Black Men, <laughs> continue to talk about how the Biden Harris campaign the only doesn't say anything. <laughs> so to the black the only black black so somebody catch me up because somebody asked me the question. Were they saying like okay, okay so Roland is is making the point of. You, we need to, he, we need to direct, directly address what black men are looking for. He so he, he believes because I've watched some of the commentary. He believes one that he's a political genius and that he knows exactly how to message every part of the population, and that he would sweep every election from the president down to the school board in every city, in every county, in every part of the country. But <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but the wild the wild part is he's like they need the message directly to black men, and I would be honest with you, like as a black man, the things that black men like about Trump are not things that I stand with. Like I'm embarrassed as a black man to say that you are attracted to his misogyny, you are attracted to his racism, you are attracted to what you consider this bully pulpit. Because you want to feel like in your life you can be that misogynist, that racist, and that powerful. And that's not a good thing. So it's like, when they say, oh, we're not going to vote for the rest of the two evils. I mean, you're talking about someone who's pandering. His, his whole goal to get black men is to say, I'm not a punk. Like, I'm going to strong arm people. Is that really what we want to what we want to reflect? Like, is that the image that we want to put on? On a number, on a, on a, on a, even on a sizable portion of black men, though? Yes, I it mean, does. I mean, educated, non-educated, all that. Let's, look, really let's a lot remember. Of look at that and be like, "Yeah, I'm with Trump on that." Let's let's remember that in many cases, we as black men and are attracted to things that show off our masculinity. I mean, we have very fragile egos. I mean, we deal with it in our relationships, even with women. I know some, I know all black men date women, but even our relationships in general. Even even men who date other men who deal with women can still be misogynists. They can still be just as nasty to women as heterosexual men can be. So I think that in general, we have to be honest and say Trump is pandering to our flaws and the worst of what we are. And that's going to get him probably 12 percent of black men, 15 percent of black men, because and some of these people are going to be church going Southern Christian, Northern, you know, economically focused because they they're pandering to the, the worst of the worst of what we are, in my opinion, in terms of like how we deal with society, how we deal. Because, again, people don't want to like be like Trump because they want to be like him, like personally, they want to feel that power. They want to feel like they have dominion over other people. So it's like, it's kind of like that whole thing I talk about in terms of some, some feminist theory says, like, you know, black men want to be the white men of black people. We want to be in control. And that's what Trump puts out to. So I think it's a terrible thing. But again, people like Roland are trying to like say, message to them, talk to them. 
But nothing, I don't believe anything that Kamala or Joe Biden can say that can have that, my bad, that can have that effect because it's, it's just going to, again, it's going to pander to the worst of what we are and what the worst of who we are. And that's just the, the God's honest truth. Aaron, if you had to say that there was a there was, there was a percentage of brothers that that are feeling like ours is described, and I, I can obviously there's a lot of people that could get think anything, but do you think it's a big enough portion, like white women voting for Trump, that can change an election? Do you think it's a big enough percentage of us that can shift this thing that way? Stockholm syndrome, proximity to whiteness. It sounds bad, but like, they like like or just spoke to it. Like and it's there is a percentage of it. There is a percentage of the people of the world who are an embarrassment to their credentials. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Boyce Watkins, uh, who <laughs> will sit here <laughs> and continue to, you know, I mean, we could sit here and harp on the criminal justice system, the criminal justice system, whether Kamala was a DA or a prosecutor or not, right? She did her job well. She's a prosecutor. The unfortunate thing is that in certain many places, that means that you're going to be prosecuting a lot of black men. Um, there are a lot of black men who are literally holding on to that one thing. Um, that that one thing, right? There's no conversation regarding self discipline. There's no conversation, and this is not even the respectability politics conversation. It's a thought process of there are a lot of us who look like us who choose to engage in things that put us into a system that's meant to already work against us, right? So we don't even want to have that conversation. It's just like, oh, as a black woman, you should have been like doing more to like not do this with us. And it's like, okay, well, there's two sides to this conversation. But yeah, there's a there's a significant amount of black men who are literally gonna sit here and like that one thing um on her record, which doesn't look good. It it doesn't look good in the general sense, but when we're talking about a a whole like a whole a holistic view of somebody from a political standpoint if you're holding on to that one thing man this is stop like shut up like we don't even need to talk to you right now you not even like, need to be engaged with this you really just don't want to vote for a black woman like stop it like this is like that you're making that active decision it has nothing to do with that one thing about her because there was none of this energy for eric holder and he did the exact same oh. thing in his exact same position. Una, do you let's let's NBC. Do, you NBC. That, do you think that this puts black men who I guess are on board with this kind of thing and like talk to us because we're not convinced? Are we in like the Tory Lanes realm now? Like we just we we're, we're just missing it. Like we're just <laughs> we're we're missing our own BS. Like are we are we in the Tory Lanes orbit at this point? I mean, some are. <laughs> Let's keep it a fact. Some, in fact, are. Tori's there. Um, but when I, <laughs> and, and all the people that were, you know, oh, his album bangs. Um, uh, but I think, yeah. But I think it, you're, fi you're trying to find an excuse, like, like Eric was saying. And is it really that, you, that that's a problem for you? Then what have you done? Because if you're only voting in the presidential elections, you're not doing anything. So don't, so it's 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 clear that like people are trying to nitpick cuz they're not bringing the same energy for every candidate. So I'm I'm I ain't gonna lie. I'm I'm surprised to hear that 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 there's that the majority I believe there's a there's a sizable enough portion of brothers who are going to say if you don't talk directly to me then I can take my vote and, and swing this thing in a different way. Like, and as we saw from the last election, we, we know it don't take many people. It doesn't take look, a lot. Look, I said it because I was one of people who responded to Roland Martin because, like I said, I used to look up to the guy. I had to, like, call him out on some mess about HBCUs two years ago, and we already had that, we already had that episode. Right. But it's an illusory inferiority complex of black men. It's the belief that we are the most persecuted amongst black people, which when you really peel back the metrics and the statistics, we know that's not true from a quantitative and qualitative standpoint, right? So we have this, this innate belief that we are we have the worst black experience of black people and everything has to be pandered 
or or aim towards us. And that's not the truth. So this is why people say things like black men are the black, are black men of black people. This is why people say that a lot of black men don't want black freedom. They want black male liberation. This is these these types of things where people are like willing to sit here and say that, oh well, yeah, now nah, Trump speaks to me. And while we're on that topic, there are black women that buy into that who are also now supporting Trump. But it's very, 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 very few. There was an eight point eight, eight point gap in twenty sixteen. The effect of what I was looking up, Trump got eight percent of black men of, of black people who voted. Ninety two percent of black men voted for Trump. Uh, I mean, sorry, voted for Hillary. Ninety eight percent. Sorry, ninety eight percent voted for um, voted for voted for Hillary. So six point gap. But again, eight percent of black people overall voted for Donald Trump. So. Wow. That, that, not to say that people can't have their own political beliefs. Um, where your politics lie usually lands where your pocketbook, uh, you know, where your Bible sits in your house, all that kind of thing. I, I get it. I totally get it. But it is it is difficult if 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 you are in part of the conversation of the the the, the clash of politics and and race in this country. Like it's it's fun. I, I don't know that those things your money or your religion or your other stuff trumps that at this point maybe some other time not now and so i'm I'm surprised to hear i'm very surprised to hear that that that's something that we should be concerned about let's move on to the next people still donate to the builder fund (laughs) let's move on to the next subject and we touched on this just a minute ago uh coronavirus and hbcu so so much of the time that we spent talking about this leading up to the start of the semester was how long is this going to last? How early are we going to go home? Are these students going to be standing outside, spreading this around? And now we're at homecoming time and you don't, for those campuses that are still open to the public, you, you don't see a bunch of outbreaks. Now, there's been an increasing amount of coverage, <laughs> an increasing amount of coverage about this. We've seen presidents on National TV talking about here's how our our testing and our contact tracing works. Our students are are a one in terms of protecting each other, wearing masks. We take it seriously. You look at, at charts, particularly in North Carolina, where they're saying here's where all of our state institutions are. Your lower tier in terms of infection rates are HBCUs collected at the bottom. My sense is that I, I'm not sure that we're better than other institutions. And I don't mean that as a dig, like black folks just are lucking out. I just think that we don't, we are benefiting from a couple of things going on. People don't, people, uh, people, I think, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think black folks take the coronavirus seriously. Even when we're standing around in a crowd, I have yet to see a video of of students in the lobby packed on each other. It's always outside. That doesn't make it better, as we know from the Rose Garden. But I'm saying I haven't seen people in in a video in a dorm room 30 deep playing Madden. I haven't seen, you know, a a, a bunch of party videos where it's like it's sweat box. You know what I mean? Like not to say that it doesn't happen. I'm just saying, I think if, if, if we're going to ascribe something to HBCUs, we've gotten better at hiding the stuff that we're not supposed to be doing. And to that point, I think we've gotten better at maybe disguising the numbers a little bit, not lying. Because we've heard of a couple of institutions that just, they haven't made the news, but there are some places where there are outbreaks. Florida Memorial is one of them that has been publicized by the people who have been infected. So we we know that there's there's some outbreaks going on. They just haven't risen to the level of public coverage. So I would ask you guys, are we really good at preventing coronavirus spread? Or are we really good about not letting the media get a hold of it? (laughs) Go ahead, Frank. (laughs) So I'm just going to start by saying this. Um, I'm not going to be, I don't want to be the person to speak on Greek life in general, but there seems to be a trend that many of these historically white institutions where many of the COVID cases that contracted on camp that are contracted on campus get tied back to frat houses. Mm-hmm. 
which we don't maybe, have. <laughs> maybe, may, which is a thing, right? I mean, people right. are still having you know, you know, room parties. Let me. I, I right. know they are, right? right? But maybe, and this is just one conversation. Maybe the things that you all stereotype and say about the black schools and their fraternity life or their sorority life is really what you all do on historically white campuses. But that's an aside, right? We can go on and on about that. I don't. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. I think that we might be taking it more serious. I think educated people are taking it more serious. I don't think. I think a lot of college students really don't want to be in the house, so they're doing whatever they can to make sure that they don't have to go back home. Mm-hmm. I think that matters. I think to students who are able to get a little bit more of a taste of freedom, even in in a COVID environment, uh, freedom inside you know big mama house and the same thing is freedom in your own room on campus where there's some restrictions because you know you got to take hybrid or all online classes or whatever it may be so i, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle put a memorial though yo yeah mm. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't have enough words that y'all wilding now but the, part of that culture oh no let me throw it to you because you went to school in florida part of that culture is that Floridians, at least on the subject of COVID-19, have have bought into, and this is not just black folks, this is everybody. Ain't no mask. Every floor, ain't every no mask. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not doing it. You, you know what I mean? Like, I'm outside, don't say anything to me. But now you're you're dealing with an institution, and, and I, I would say I don't I don't think I've heard anything from Florida Memorial. To respond to what the, the athletes and the coaches are saying, that they're saying a lot of us are getting sick and they're not responding. I'm, I'm not sure that Florida Memorial has sent out any kind of press release or the president has made a comment. Correct me if I'm wrong, if y'all have seen it. But Una, would, would you say that part of how much of it is. Go ahead. Did she freeze on it? Oh, I say, did they. Here, I'm here. Um, didn't they? Didn't they say that the uh, the coaches <laughs> didn't get fired? That was as far as it went. Oh, <laughs> I'm just. I mean, you know, the last the last thing I saw, and I could be wrong. We got to you know throw it to our our peoples that run the company that always got on the shirt. Um, <laughs> the last thing I saw was game day story. That the AD, that's where I read it, who was a former football player. <laughs> Yeah, apparently they like he fought, they suspended the coach because the coach didn't want them to play, but the AD was like, "You gonna play this season?" They so were the, the were they the only had. HBCU to play this year. Yep, well, they was playing after after sixty years of not having a football team. Right, it like a, it, it was it was a mess. It's, it's still a mess. I was hyped them to have a football team back, and then here we are. I wasn't, but I could I could understand that that you know some people are getting fatigued. A, a lot of institutions are finding you can't police this. You just don't have the public safety or the public health resources to make this possible. You can't make every student and every faculty member test every day or anytime you want to, because at some point there's a personal liberties issue here, where you can't mandate people to take a test anytime. For the places that we heard, and we won't mention them here, but all of us are aware that there are some places where there have been outbreaks. Is that good that they not that they had that this information hasn't gotten out, or should it come out? And what cost do you think that that would that would create for HBCUs negatively? So I would just say this: I know of a couple of places personally where people personally have caught the disease. Um, most of them are involved with athletics. And I think we all know how I feel about athletics. And I'm, I'm pretty disappointed. I'm disappointed that the leadership in the MEAC, the SWAC, the SIC, and the CIAA has created this environment where we're not having a season, but they're still doing workouts. Teams are still having practices. They're still doing organized team activities um, for all sports. It isn't just football. Um, and this is where a lot of the transmission is happening on campus because, again, a lot of these campuses that have minimal um, minimal people on campus in terms of living in dorms and that nature. It's a very one-off type of situation at most HBCUs. So from my perspective, it's a, excuse me, another situation where athletics 
Um, and the need for these schools to continuously try to throw money and throw attention into athletics um, is kind of having a backdrop. But to answer your question, I don't think that they should um, publicize it necessarily, but I do think that there needs to be a complete shutdown of all athletic opportunities. But the problem is that we've seen from what I consider the lack of leadership from the SWAC and the MEAC specifically, and they're pushed to have a spring season. Coaches are in a position of, do we practice now? Do we not? Do we work out now? Do we not? And almost every school um, has probably had some outbreaks, be it public or not public, from in the locker room, in the weight room, or on the field, or you know, practice facility because of that. But again, we're talking about oh, Bayou Classic in in Shreveport this year. Like that was the that was the biggest sports story of the week before you know Florida Memorial's outbreak. But so how are they going to play? We talked about this before because we were we were under the impression over the course of the summer that everything that they would do, particularly on the subject of sports, was to slow walk this thing to give people the impression oh we might come back next month oh we might come back in you know we might come back in September. But the oh, problem really? is you, you can't prepare. Like, here's the problem for football specifically, right? You can't prepare like that. You right, have right. to, it takes, they say, it takes at least, let's say 60 days mm-hmm. to prepare for a football season. In most cases, you want about 120 days, you want about four months. So if they're telling them, oh, we're going to be playing and starting in February, when are they going to start lifting? They've already been right. lifting. So, right. and that's my issue that they, I don't think, in my opinion, once those kids got on campus and most of them got on campus at the same time they would have normally in late July, early August, yep. they've been operating in the same exact way and nothing has changed for athletics. And this is where the issues at LSU have been, even at the big white schools, have been the same issues. And I'll just I'll leave with this there's no way that Alabama had 90 kids on the field this weekend. 30,000 people in the stands and they have not one case. <laughs> you know, you know, in Florida, they're going back to 100% capacity for Miami games this week. 100% with 90 kids on the roster, 20, 30 coaches, athletic training staffs, other staff, and 100,000 people in the Orange Bowl. And we, we just, okay. <laughs> Eric, last two minutes to you. Do you think that the, the 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 BCS schools are putting pressure on the HBCUs to compete, not this fall, but perhaps in the spring? Like there's increased pressure. Like y'all better get on the field, no matter what this I, virus is doing. I hope the hell not. Uh, <laughs> look, we just had a conversation earlier this week about why HBCUs are going to be in the NCAA to begin with, anyway, right? Mm-hmm. We just we just had that conversation, especially you know, not to break that story on here because people hardly ain't paid attention. But the NAIA pretty much said, "Oh yeah, uh, we'll we've approved that if like students get paid for their likenesses while they're doing you know athletics, right?" Right. So like, let, let's not like we've already had that conversation. I'm, my biggest question is this: there is absolutely no athletic director of any HBCU with the exception of maybe. Three that could sit here and tell me they're making a profit off the football season this year mm-hmm. by having a season. There's not an HBCU that tell you that a year ago when there was actually a season. Mm-hmm. So you got to sit here and ask yourself a question as to like what what about your egos of a, 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 as an institutional ego, right? Or is it just the fact that oh yeah we're, you're hoping that you can get people to come to campus for homecoming? Is that what it is? Like at some point you gotta you gotta like what's wrong with our business model? Because y'all ain't making money off it. <laughs> like, let's let's stop. Let's stop the mess. We just we, like I wish I could have seen this conversation. We say you talk about the like at best basketball, and football are probably overall the fourth and fifth best sports that take place at HBCU campuses Ooh. as far as the quality of athlete. Bowling, right? track, <laughs> bowling, bowling, track, softball, maybe even baseball above that, right? Depending on where you're at, especially school like at FAMU, I definitely would say that you get a better quality of, of baseball player than you do a football player on an average year. Ooh. Right? <laughs> I, like I'll go, I'll go that far, right? Shoot, if you want to include the band with it, keep knocking down. If you want to include the chills with it, keep knocking down. Like 
like if you want to continue like include those as sports if reasons as people reasons for people to actually go to school there like there's absolutely a very small percentage of people who attend hbcus because of the basketball or football team that don't actually play in athletics so mm-hmm. what is the return on the investment in trying to build up these schools but to hope that you get into a money game that can be maybe your third best uh, payday at a school or at a given year because your HBCU president doesn't want to bring in enough money. Like, let's have that conversation. And you make a perfect segue into the next topic, HBCU endowments. So CNN Money runs a story today about, uh, or is ready, um, about the prospect of HBCUs becoming more aggressive and involved in um, venture capital funding. Now, this is something we see often with a lot of white institutions. Arizona State is a big one. Harvard is a big one. There are a couple of PWIs that have really made a big name in. We will put hundreds of millions of dollars into venture capital. We will have a stake of ownership in tech companies, uh, in green in green uh, industry, uh, in international development, real estate. We'll have holdings in a whole bunch of stuff because we have that much money in our endowment to do it. Or we have a fundraising mechanism where rich people will give us money specifically to do that in the name of the institution, right? So this is an article that says HBCUs need to get in on that action. I'm reading it. I can understand it. And it reads like there's a black venture capitalist somewhere in Silicon Valley on the periphery that says, sister, we need you to talk about HBCUs because we're not getting a lot of money uh, from the black community otherwise. Um, Let's try to get some of these black colleges involved. And it missed a lot of the nuance of saying HBCUs ain't got no endowment money like that where they can take even a couple hundred grand and put it into a tech startup company wait four years for something that might fail when they got they got kids and students that they have to put through school with that endowment money so i would ask y'all if y'all have seen the article or if you haven't what do you think about the prospect as the cat has joined me in the background uh what do you think about the prospect of hbcus using endowment funds or foundation funds to be a part of the venture capital space in silicon valley and beyond Eric saying no, or go ahead. You were you were jumping at the bit on this one. I mean, I mean, I, I would say this right as somebody who works in a finance capacity, I think it would be a horrendous mistake. <laughs> horrendous. Um, one because it's called venture capital because it is a venture; it is not a guaranteed um, return. And what the article also talked about is that these schools are not spending large percentages of their endowment on VC. We're talking about usually less than 1% for schools like Harvard. Our entire HBCU endowment is like (laughs) 1% of Harvard's endowment. So, um, (laughs) you know, and also I talked this earlier, I mean, they say on average HBCU graduates graduate with about 30% more in debt. So how are we fulfilling our mission um, if we're using monies that clearly we're comfortable with throwing the dice on and we're not investing it back into students. I think as in general, we have to rethink how our endowment is going to be managed and how we look at um, utilizing those resources to, to make improvements to the university. Um, I think in most cases, our universities are in areas that have had cheap real estate for years and we haven't used the endowments in terms of real estate. We, we, we've been in areas that have boomed. Obviously, the, the, the prices in D.C. and in Baltimore and um, even in Winston-Salem and Durham, we can go through the list of cities where if any of those schools in those places have bought up more land, um, what it would be worth now. Look what John Hopkins is doing in Baltimore, what GW mm-hmm. did in D.C. Um, so I, I just think that it sounds good in theory, but what we also have to keep in mind and realize is that we don't have that much money. I mean, the entire Southern University system, they own what best averages say 50 million for the entire system. We're talking about four campuses or three and a half campuses. So we don't have that much money. Um, and when we do get money, it has an immediate need. <laughs> so we don't have that type of we don't have that type of money. And also that ties back into athletics, but we don't have consistent revenue streams besides tuition. We don't make money on anything else except tuition and fees. 
Mm-hmm. We don't have a lot of research money coming in. We don't have any. Af- af- we don't have no auxiliary money coming in. Um, I mean, I know for many schools, because I talked with William at HBCU Money about this, they lose money on even some of their academic operations. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) when we're talking about investing in venture capital in Silicon Valley, like, go watch the show Silicon Valley on HBO and you tell me if that's going to be a a worthwhile investment. Because that's really how it happens in many cases. You you hear a piece of what they're trying to do and you hope it hits. Because for every Google, there's hundreds of companies who try to start search engines, search engines that fail, and we don't, we can't be as loose with our money. But also, again, if we ha- if we could spend a hundred thousand dollars, then I'd say do it. But we don't even have hundred thousand dollars. I mean, we literally have schools who have put off major infrastructure projects. I mean, at Morgan, Holmes Hall has been flooding for twenty years, so <laughs> they better not spend a dime on VC. <laughs> so let me let me say real quick. So one thing I will give HBCUs credit in terms of strategic uh, economic development. There are a lot of schools that have done a good job of trying to to get into the real estate factor. Hampton obviously has done a great job buying up a commercial area around the campus. Uh, Alcorn has done a good job buying residential space. Miles College in Fairfield, Alabama. There there are places where they're trying to, to get into real estate as a revenue stream, whether that's for students and faculty renting out space to live, whether that's for storefronts to come in and bring jobs and commerce there and there's revenue there. But I'm going to just say this and I'm going to throw it to Una. And I hope this doesn't step on any toes. I don't see how HBCUs could jump at the, could jump, chomp at the bit to support Silicon Valley startups. When you have alumni making products and doing goods and services, and we can't even get we can't even break through to get our alma mater to give us a contract. I can't tell you how many how many people got a clothing line that's decent that the students actually buy. And the bookstore won't pick it up. <laughs> right? <laughs> I can't tell you how many how many HBC alumni own a car dealership. And we don't lease cars from them for the motor pool. We don't even solicit those car dealerships to be in the damn homecoming parade. So, but you, but but you talking about it's startup city, like like we should we should jump all in that. Like, don't, shouldn't we talk? Una, shouldn't we talk about the culture? Because we we can't even buy our own stuff. We can't even buy our alumni stuff. And you saying let's go let's go put millions into a startup? Listen, or let's hit it. I mean, HBC Toronto, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Early. Um, yeah, no, but let's hit it. Like we don't have we ain't we we gonna mess around, play with the church's money and lose it. We don't have that. But like you said, Jared, like we need to be looking at organizations that are actually from alumni and doing stuff for the institutions like HBCU Palante, um, in order to build our base, to build um the the student body to diversify but still maintaining the mission i think it's a misstep it's definitely a misstep you you have architects but you don't look at look to them to assist in building you have all of these resources but nobody's looking at them it doesn't make sense and when you but you're going to go beyond your walls and pay for something else that might not work out that's that's reason to get shit yeah, get your teeth knocked because <laughs> that's not that's that's not a game plan. Fred, do you think that it's just the notion of it's Silicon Valley and we should be players? And, I, and let me be fair. I'm not saying a bunch of HBCUs are running to do this. I'm just we're just reacting to this story that's in CNN money. Right. But do you could you see a bunch of schools saying, let's try to make a way to get this done? And to be honest, is it the white man's ice and colder? Is that is that what this is? Seeking proximity to whiteness will kill our schools. It's really that simple, right? In the state of Alabama, if any of the HBCUs wanted to invest in something, why not figure out how to invest in the people who graduated from their schools who are now working in Huntsville, which is one of the largest, uh, one of the fastest growing cities in the entire state of Alabama, in the STEM field at that, right? Um, why is there not a more defined 
uh, investment. And this is something that I personally want to research and want to do for my life. I can speak to it on experiential learning um, built into the curriculum so that by the time somebody finishes a bachelor's degree, they are connected with someone who already graduated from the school, had a job working in the field, they were actually pursuing a bachelor's degree going towards. And by the time they graduated, they already had two, three years experience doing the work that they want to do. So now they actually want to get back to the school because you literally led them to it up. At this point, our HBCUs are better off investing in Forex than they are in Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> They got a slight, like, what? Like, and it's, oh, wow, like, come on, like, like, and it's rude. It's very rude, but it, I, ha I had to be slightly offensive because at this point, if y'all keep thinking, like, let's be quite clear. If you're not Howard, Spellhouse, maybe Hampton, you don't even need to be in this conversation. Not because they're better schools, but because y'all are not national brands and y'all can't compete when you're not a national brand. I could sit here and talk about how, literally speaking, a month ago, I sat here and spoke on, spoke on the phone with two of my best friends that both went to Winston, and I said, hey, yo, there's a 17-acre plot of land for sale literally down the street from winston Salem State going for $200,000. The fact that I saw that and nobody at Winston saw that and that whole is already off the market is an embarrassment to Orders' point. You want to talk about buying up land, expanding your campus, doing more with what you have? As my girlfriend said, likes to quote, Issa Ray says all the time, network sideways. You won't even network with who you already have access to. Y'all talk about Silicon Valley? Stop it. Y'all ain't but, ready for that. But it also speaks to the point of how do we how do we re envision the HBCU Foundation, right? Because for so many years, it, and not even just the foundation, the the affiliated organizations, UNCF, Thurgood Marshall College Fund, we looked at those as scholarship provision tools. So they will help us fundraise. They will help us market. We'll get more money in or more donations in, and we'll be able to pass that along to support students coming in. That'll be our primary source of revenue. If we can give you, every student you know, a little but, bit. See, but that's the problem. We're not innovative in our revenue operations. Like it, there, for instance, I, I used the example before, but like there are tons of schools like Clemson, for instance, right? Clemson on average makes over a million dollars a year from current students buying into athletics mm -hmm. like when we talk about we talk about even even you lead the nation fcs attendance every single year thirty thousand people every single year and i think my uh my froze but literally they could be making let's say on average if you make five dollars a person per game at thirty thousand dollars thirty thousand people a game 30, people, right? you're, you're looking at Half a half a million easy, and that and you could do that by selling pens. You could be selling, you know, Vista print T-shirts and business cards. Like, but, but again, we have no innovative revenue operations. I mean, HC like to hire me. I would love to do that. I work in revenue analysis. I would love. I would love to do that. Plugs, but <laughs> but I mean, the HBCUs could literally sign, work out a deal with with Vista Print, get an insurance company like Geico to pay for it, get a bunch of cheap T-shirts printed, and go ahead and sell them at games for ten dollars a piece. You take fifty percent of that revenue, five dollars a person. You sell ten thousand T-shirts a game. Come on now, you're looking at oh no. You look, you're looking at further it, with, now, wait a minute. When the last time you seen 10,000 people at HBCU game? That's not home. No, 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 no. Alcorn. No. See, the funny thing about that, Eric, I mean, is that the schools that need the money most are the ones with the highest attendance. Alcorn mm. needs that money. Jackson State needs that money. Mississippi Valley State definitely need that money. No, so, first time, man. Yeah, so, people have 50,000 people. First time. They come no, it, man. Take and, it. And, and, watch and, and, for and, and, and they're not making. So, we look at a certain stat in, in my business where you look at the amount of spend per customer. And our goal is to make that customer spend as much as possible whenever they're within our premises. Right now, HBC is only getting a ticket fee, and that's and that's if they get that. So, could we definitely get in the parking? Because who, who knows who knows where that money goes? So, so, oh, God. God. so no, actually, or you brought up a great point. If they you brought up a great point, my bad. Go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm adding to your point. You brought up a great point because, honestly speaking, we're the larger conversation. It impacts return on investment, right? Because what are you really, what's the school doing to actually make sure the school grows? Because we spend a lot of money, 
we don't necessarily we, we definitely ain't making a lot of money. We 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 get like maybe a hundred thousand dollars over over zero every single year, right? Watch this. So based upon the plan he just said, if you're working with Vistaprint to get a shirt design, you have majors on your campus who maybe graphic design majors, they might work in marketing. How many of them would would jump at the opportunity to actually create a shirt that now this the now the school sells at their actual games that people will now pay for that will not only build up the career of one of your students who need that opportunity while they're still in the undergrad, while also making money for the actual school by getting 10,000 people to pay $5 per shirt, right? We don't, we don't want to think that way. We want to do the things that we've always done to what we always got. And, and, and even on top of that, none of this even happens but we're still sitting here saying, oh, yeah, we're going to spend this much money. We're going to spend this much money on athletics and this much money on research. And then our students sit here and complain as to why we don't get philanthropic dollars. Whew. Well, and we're going to round out the conversation because that, that that's something that could take a whole a whole hour's worth of topic. Um, but then we're going to round out with 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 students, interestingly enough. So Travis Scott got on what Twitter the other night? And said he was going to pay a semester's worth of tuition uh, for five HBCU students, and it was kind of it was funny because it was kind of an afterthought because he said I'm going to pay five students tuition, and then the next tweet was at an HBCU. So I think the PR team was like, "You were supposed to say that first, bro," and like, and then he and then he followed he followed it up. So I, I look at it in two ways. One, I vaguely know who Travis Scott is. Uh, I only know him by 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 my sons. I. I um, <laughs> I mean, I, I know he got a meal at McDonald's. I mean, you know, <laughs> but, but, but the second thing is, is, is this part of, uh, as we saw with Chris Paul and we've seen with other, other celebrities that are, that are buying into HBCU culture financially, Chris Paul gives HBCUs free marketing. That's a money, that's a money move. Um, Big time playoff stage. That's a money move. We got free marketing out of that. Travis Scott is saying, I'm going to pay five kids tuition to HBCUs. I would ask you, do you think that we're at the point where we've always wanted to be, which is to be mainstream for a lot of high platform, high visible African Americans? Or do you think like, okay, we're now getting to the point where black folks that are with a platform are starting to co-opt HBCUs? Because I think that this in particular with Travis Scott, five students for a semester, like if you would frame that I'm going to pay off the, the bills of, of five seniors at HBCUs who need gap funding to graduate or have some tickets or some library books or something. Okay, but when you randomly say I'm going to pay five students HBCU, okay, now are we jumping the shark here? It's almost like you woke up and said, "I'm I'm gonna pay five students HBCU," and I and I'm and I'm wondering like, is that alignment or is that co-opting at this point? Because I, I don't really know who Travis Scott is, so I, <laughs> I'm a, I'm gonna ask somebody who knows who he is, who's a fan. Is anybody a fan of Travis Scott? Yeah, I live in okay. Houston. How can I be a fan? Of Travis? Well, him, well, him I would like to be. Uh, I just I'm, I might be too old. Uh, but, but what do you think about you and others that are doing this? You can go ahead, Una. No, I, I asked what him saying. Right. I think I think oh if you're forty, if you're forty and over, like I mean, like, I, mean like, I mean, his fan base. I mean, I might know, like you know, they be playing the the, the stuff, but I, I couldn't tell base, you. His fan base is like ninety nine percent white, so that's the first thing. Like, and black people do bang with him. But he's not, I mean, he's not, you know, uh, he's not Fat Pat in Houston, you know. <laughs> like, not you know, he's, yeah, he, he's, I mean, he, he he's kind of like the weekend. And in between, you got, you know, black fans, white fans. <laughs> Let him sing. No. Let him sing. I mean, I'll say this. Do I, think, do I think it's a good thing he did? I mean, that's nice. But I think that we expect too much of celebrities and, and of their intelligence and of what they can bring or can bring to the table, um, be it ones who we like and adore, who I won't name, or people who we don't know who they exist, like like Travis Scott. But I think that um, in general, 
to expect them to be educated on the best way to facilitate um, HBCU engagement, I think is wrong. Um, I think in general, there needs to be more of a conversation of how we steer these people to places that can can deal with things in the correct way. And you can feel you want to feel about TMCF and UMCF, but I'm sure that, you know, the money will be more equally distributed <laughs> um, mm. than, than if you would just do that. And again, this is the middle of the semester. The bills have already been, I mean, the, the drop, <laughs> the drop day. We're going home at Thanksgiving, bro. Yeah. Like, the drop <laughs> day been passed. The drop day been passed. You already, you know, like, so I just think, that, I think in general, it's, it's a weird thing. But I think in general, I don't like the idea of like, oh, I'm going to go take, I'm going to go pay your bill. That's cool. But what are we doing to make these bills kind of go away? He could have, he could, he literally could have went to PV or TSU and endowed a scholarship. And he could have had the Travis Scott McDonald's scholarship as part of his McDonald's deal. But again, his management is majority, you know, men of a different shade, more of the palm of my hand, not the back of my hand. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, so I don't think anyone in his corner will be like, you know what? Because friends like James Harden has an endowed scholarship at TSU, right? Um, right. So clearly, there are people who have done a little bit more to figure out. Okay, I, let me go over to TSU and drop some money, um, you know. But I just don't think that he has that level of. Uh, well, that, that's to the point. I think that there's. It doesn't appear, and I, and I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm, I'm crapping on dude's gift. Like God bless him for helping out some students. But I think that what we've grown to appreciate over this summer. The summer of George Floyd, the summer of Breonna Taylor, the summer of Ahmaud Arbery, the summer of the, the elect, the 2020 election is that we want to be more strategic as a people. And one of the things that, that I've taken a lot of joy and a lot of pride in is that some of these gifts that have come to HBCUs are designed in such a way that it won't just be, I'm going to pay your bills or I'm going to help out 250 HBCU students. There, this is going to be money that's going to keep making money over the long term. So some of these gifts that are going to endowments, that's going to help you boost your endowment earnings. That's 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 money making money for you. That's what we really needed. And when you talk about James Harden endowing a scholarship, that's not just I'm paying your, your tuition off for a little bit. I'm going to give you 100 grand so you can make returns off that 100 grand every single year. And you can take those returns and give it to some of the students for scholarships. You can build a building, something like that. It helps you to, to boost your your endowment profile. It helps you induce your profile because you had a celebrity athlete in the city give you some money. There's strategy behind that. McCourt Maker and Mikey Williams, the two brothers coming out of high school who are talking on Twitter about I'm considering an HBCU. And not only are they saying that, they're saying that because it, that means black talent needs to stay at black institutions. That's strategic. They're talking about finance because they know their brand. And they're saying, if I take my brand to a black college, the black college will make money. That's strategy. Travis Scott saying I'm gonna pay five people tuition for a semester, bro. It takes we we in there for two. <laughs> it's a, an academic year, two semesters. Like what? I, I, this this man's mother went to Grambling, and his father went to Prairie View. And because of that, I can't give this Bama nothing more than that's nice. <laughs> that's that's really all I can do. It's like, okay, that's nice. Like, come on, dude. Like, I'm I'm supposed to be overly excited because you covered a semester from these people. And I, I think it's a great thing that you did that, and that's nice and everything. But dude, you literally just you spent maybe what fifty like a like point five percent of the chicken you got from McDonald's for making that whack ass like <laughs> Travis got burned meal plan. <laughs> The Travis Scott, they got a quarter pounder with cheese with, with, with bacon and like, bacon on it. That's the thing, right? And barbecue like, sauce with fries. Well, barbecue sauce with fries. Like, oh, that, I'm so, oh, I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed. <laughs> as a as a slight anecdote, McDonald's and Popeyes y'all are not weak because last fall Popeyes did a Migos plan, McDonald's mm -hmm. did a Travis Scott plan, and then sold merch with it, and now they're doing a Bad Bunny plan. I see who you're marketing to, and y'all are not low, but that's right. the side. Right, I'm not. I like. I'm a Travis Scott fan. I went to see the Astro World concert. I seen that Bama like twice last year. 
<laughs> like in the last two years or something like that. Like I'm a fan, but I, I'm not gonna give him like kudos for this. Like for what? Like that's nice, dude. I'm sorry. Like there's people on the HBCU campuses who hungry. Go pass some meal or something. <laughs> like, like, we, what you, are you doing? You and I are of a certain age where we don't really know who this dude is. So how how should we how, how should we react to his gift? And is it something that you think alumni should say? Hey, you know, well, I don't know who this dude is, but maybe we should we should capitalize on this. Maybe we should appeal to other celebrities or appeal to local folks who are are heavy or well known to do the same thing. Like I, I honestly, uh, part of what's catching me up with this, I'm tripping. I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> you don't know who he is. It's, so I'm it's just awkward. asking like folks like us who we're starting to get to that alumni. I don't know who anybody is. <laughs> like what should we do with this information? <laughs> like, uh, what should what what alumni should do with that information is something that's very very small that I've done in the past. I would go back to my school's homecoming. And I would get permission to go into my freshman dorm. I would go to the room that I was in, and I was and I would talk to the people that were staying in that room, ask them how the semester was going because they were typically freshmen, and I would pass them hundred dollars each. It's small, but now they have a connection to someone who actually came from literally the room they came from mm-hmm. and made it to a certain place, right? Like Travis Scott's doing what he did is great, but then what? There's no point like, to your point. Are you passing out hundred dollars when you go back to Hampton? Oh, um, I go to N one Visa and I do give money back to whoever's staying in that room. Last year there wasn't anybody in there. I went across the hall. Um, so I do the same. <laughs> I mean, we keep it a stack. My little sister was right there. She watched me. Um, shout out to Heather. But um, mm-hmm. it. What do you do with that? Like, it's not it it's a hustle backwards right so like yeah okay son said that he gonna give money cool but then like you said because i didn't even see i ain't see the um the tweet you had to then it's, he had to come back behind it and say oh to hbcus like son right. wasn't really like he he wasn't hard pressed he wasn't pressed to give it to hbcus what he was trying to do was be out there okay right, right, right. but so we and what's how is that any different from what we've seen where somebody's like, because I don't think it was HBCUs, but didn't Nikki do something? I mean, somebody's always like, oh, let me give some guap. All right, cool. But then what? Because like Eric said, there's two semesters in a whole <laughs> academic year. Like, heads is still going to be hungry. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and with my, my hundred that I give to a freshman in, in N1 VC Hall, shout out cuties. Um, what's that supposed to do? Like... Mm-hmm. It, it's for the moment and I do give my information and I do tell them like, Hey, hit me up if you need something. And I've gotten hit once and we, we carried on the conversation, but is there truly a conversation being had? Is this long-term like, is this truly civic engagement or photo op? Mm. That, that, that is what I think that we have to, to do a better job of now HBCUs. I will say to be very fair, they do a really good job of building those relationships locally. So there are some businesses, there are some lawmakers where HBCUs are in constant connection with some folks and there's a sizable amount of money that comes through. Obviously, we'd love to have more million dollar gifts. We love to have more hundred million dollar gifts. We hope that black folks don't got to get shot in the streets for people to keep giving us money. Um, we hope that this is something longstanding. Um, but it is to say, like, at some point, do you have to call it out? Almost like we talked about with the coronavirus, all gifts aren't necessarily great gifts. I think we accept all gifts, but I think that we take some responsibility in saying, not necessarily give me some more money, but let's talk about a partnership here. Let's not just do something for Twitter or the gram. Like, let's talk about an institutional partnership with people who want to align their brand with supporting Black America, with supporting education, with supporting workforce development, because if we if we fall into too many of these relationships, where it's just like I'm a useful tool for your brand, they'll wear off in a heartbeat. As popular as HBCUs are today, tomorrow K through 12 could be just as popular, and our philanthropic pipelines are gone. Tomorrow it could be I'm a start a charter school. Tomorrow I'm gonna get to youth basketball. Tomorrow I'm gonna give money to Africa like Oprah. 
So we we have to, to focus on how do we partner with a lot of these these high level business people, celebrities, athletes, whatever, to say let's let's have a relationship that benefits you and your brand as much as it benefits our school, our community, our students. So we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for tuning in to Digest After Dark. We really appreciate it. Again, visit us, hbcudigest.substack.com. Tune in on uh, Sirius XM 142 HBC Radio, the pride of Howard University. Digest After Dark, we'll see you the next time. Peace.